Okay, here we go for session number two in our study of the faith of our founders. And we, we just covered uh, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. Now we're going to look at, who's next? And the memorial, those were the uh, things that we showed you before. We just did Franklin Memorial. Alexander Hamilton. And the quote that I picked out for him, where he said, for in my own part, I sincerely esteem it a system which without the finger of God never could have been suggested and agreed upon by such a diversity of interests. He was talking about the Constitutional Convention. That's what he was saying. He's saying that without the finger of God, it never would have worked. And that's a phrase that you hear them use very often, the, 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 the finger of God. So that, that's what he was talking about, about them. Alexander Hamilton, referring to the ultimate success of the Constitution, they just read that. Alexander Hamilton was a uh, secretary and aide-de-camp to George Washington. Uh, Alexander Hamilton, uh, from 1777 to 1781, who was a member of the Continental Congress in 1782-83, and in 1787-88. In 1787, he was a representative to the Constitutional Convention. He was the first United States Secretary of the Treasury and ran for the presidency against Aaron Burr in 1800 and then governor of New York in 1804. You talk about Jersey, you know that's where Alexander Hamilton had his duel with Aaron Burr. Uh, right there off of was it Teaneck or Jersey? Or oh, right across from George Washington Bridge. That's where they had the duel, uh, Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr. And Aaron Burr killed Alexander Hamilton. Mm -hmm. All right. Now understand this, Aaron Burr at the time was the vice president of the country. <laughs> oh. Isn't that something? But they had such a feud, an ongoing feud for years between Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr. Uh, basically, Alexander Hamilton was more a, a, a federalist. He wanted more uh, power and in, in, uh, centralized. Aaron Burr was more, he was really like a, a, a classic politician. He just wanted whatever, whatever. He had no principles. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, not, not only that, I mean, after they had their duel, there's a lot of controversy about, about the duel itself. I don't want to get into that now, but the idea is that uh, uh, Jeff, uh, 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 Hamilton, they don't know who shot the first shot, first of all. But they know that Hamilton shot what ended up in a tree above Aaron Burr's head. They found the bullet. He got off one shot. Uh, Aaron Burr's shot got him in the stomach. Mm -hmm. They don't know who shot the first shot, but one theory is that Hamilton never intended to kill him. Mm -hmm. So he put his, he, that he intentionally shot away because he didn't want to, because of his faith, he didn't want to commit murder mm -hmm. at that point. That's mm -hmm. one theory. The other theory is that he went to shoot at him, but Aaron Burr's shot hit him in the stomach and as he hit him, he shot off and it went up in the tree. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, we don't know, you know, what the truth is, but we do know that uh, and that Hamilton's dead. You know, he they they wrote. Imagine this. Then they, they they had a row from Manhattan to Jersey to the dueling spot, and then after he got shot, they had to carry him back down the hill, put him back in the boat, and row him back to to Manhattan again, <laughs> where they did. And he lasted, I forget how many hours. I think the next day, I think he actually died, you know, of a wound to, to, his, to his stomach. And, uh, but Aaron Burr then, so vice president of the country, so what does he do? He said, I'm in trouble. <laughs> and he takes off, and first he goes to an island in, in, in the Atlantic, and then he ends up in Louisiana, somewhere like that, and he tries to start his own country down there. So that's a whole big another story. Wow. This was the vice president of the United wow. States. So. What eventually happened to him? Huh? What eventually I think he died in obscurity or something. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I wonder, Who's, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Whose vice president was he? Jefferson's? Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 Exactly. yeah. So, all right. All right. So moving right along there. Hamilton, uh, uh, Alexander Hamilton would say, I've read that, uh, last paragraph. Hamilton, who regularly led his household in prayer, also wrote about the connection between Christianity and political freedom. He helped to form 
the Christian Constitutional Society. In 1802, letter to co-founder James Bayard, he said, quote, I now offer you the outline of the plan they have suggested. Let an association be formed to be denominated the Christian Constitutional Society. Its object to be first, the support of the Christian religion, and second, the support of the United States. Quote, I have carefully examined the evidence of the Christian religion, and if I was sitting as a juror upon its authenticity, I would unhesitatingly give my verdict in its favor. I can prove its truth as clearly as any proposition ever submitted to the mind of man. All right? So he wanted to start a society to support, number one, Christianity and the country. He saw them both as, as inter, uh, interdenominated, interconnected. He was fatally shot in a duel with Aaron Burr in July of 1804. His last words were, quote, I have a tender reliance. So this is when he was lying in the bed in, 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 in Manhattan. I have a tender, I think it was the East Village, somewhere where they brought him to, he, he, went, he didn't go home because he didn't want his family to see him at that point. So they brought him to a house in the East, East Village. But he said, then they, then they heard about it, and then, then they came to his bedside. But he said, I have a tender reliance on the mercy of the Almighty through the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. I am a sinner. I look to him for mercy. Pray for me. Mm -hmm. That was his last words. All right? Amen. So, there's any doubt there about his own Christianity. Mm -hmm. But the fact that he wanted to found a, 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 uh, an organization... Uh, for the uh, propagation of Christianity and and the, co the country is, is, is really important okay, to know what, where he's coming from. There's a lot more to be said about him, but at the same time, we've got uh, a few guys to go through here. Yeah. All right, John Adams, he's another one of my favorite old guys. He said this, he said, we have now, he was talking to the military. This was a speech he was making to, to the army at that point. He said, we have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions, unbridled by morality and religion. Avarice, ambition, revenge, or gallantry would break the strongest cords of our Constitution as a whale goes through a net. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the governing of any other. What he's saying is, our Constitution is only good as the people who are going to enforce its, its principles. And this is the problem that we have today. The problem we have today is we expect everybody to go by the Constitution. But the problem is you have one side who they want to be that well going through the net. They don't believe in the Constitution. They believe the Constitution should be whatever they say it is. Right? So that's the problem. So that's why it's so important to restore morality and religion in our country, if we're going to see this country uh, preserved. John Adams, born 1735 in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. He was a Harvard-educated lawyer and a delegate to both the First and Second Continental Congress. A leader in the independence movement, he served diplomatically in France and Holland during the Revolutionary War. He was instrumental in negotiating the Treaty of Paris, which ended the Revolutionary War. After the war, he served as minister to the court of St. James and then George Washington's vice president before becoming the second president of the United States. And on March 6, 1789, President Adams called for a national day of fasting and prayer for the country. Uh, could, and quote, call to mind our numerous offenses against the most high God, confess them before him with the sincerest penitence implore his pardoning mercy through the great mediator and redeemer for our past transgressions and that through the grace of his holy spirit we may be disposed and enabled to yield a more suitable obedience all right this was just one national day of fasting and we don't realize today back then it was a normal occurrence for the congress to declare days of fasting and prayer they would do them for two particular reasons if a big battle was coming up or if they were in trouble 
They would have fasting and prayer for supplication for God's help for the problem that they were facing. Then after they won it, they overcame it, they would have prayer and fasting and thanksgiving for the victory that God gave them in that particular situation. Now, and that was, there was over a over hundred uh, declarations that were uh, initiated by Congress during the Revolutionary War period and, and after that time. A few other quotes which demonstrate Adam's thoughts about Jesus are below. On April 18, 1775, a British soldier ordered John Hancock and others to disperse in the name of George, the sovereign king of England. Adams responded to him, we recognize no sovereign but God and no king but Jesus. All right? And actually, that was one of their battle cries, was no king but Jesus. Remember, that's who they were fighting, King George. So they would say, uh-uh, we, we recognize no king but Jesus. In an October 13, 1789, address to the military, and that was what, what, we, what we read there. In a letter to Thomas Jefferson, dated June 28, 1813, he said, The general principles on which the founders achieved the independence were the general principles of Christianity. All right? Now, John Adams was one of our founders. Uh, Adam, you know, there, there's probably over 200 men that we could include in that category of founding fathers, people that were involved with the initial stages of our, of our uh, declaration, our constitution, the Revolutionary War, and that, that period. But, you know, for the sake, we couldn't go over 200 of them, but I, I ended up with 21 of them that I thought were the, the, the most influential, important, whatever. But John Adams was one where his, his John Quincy Adams was his son. We realize the kind of people that, that formed this country. John Quincy Adams, uh, at age 14, was secretary to our ambassador to Russia at age 14. All right? He, he, and, and, and John Quincy Adams was always brought from the time he was a kid, a child. He was involved in government and helping to establish. John Adams was his dad. The only way he got that was because John Adams taught John Quincy Adams about the Bible. You know, John Quincy Adams would read through a Bible uh, every year and, and annotate it and give that to one of his kids. Uh, every year he would give his kid uh, one of the Bibles, that, that Bible that he read through that year. And John Quincy Adams actually wrote a book teaching his own children how to read the Bible through in the year, you know, teaching them. So, so these men were so solid mm -hmm. in their faith, in their biblical faith. There, yes. I seem to remember that toward the end of his life, John Adams became an, an adhered to the doctrines of the Enlightenment, and he and his son actually kind of had a little conflict back and forth. During during the French Revolution and during that time, there was a lot of influence of the Enlightenment, you know, coming into uh, our people, but but they stuck pretty much, even though they they had debate, and that was the whole purpose of America, was to have open debate and discussion. They had open the, uh, the debate, but uh, I I don't know. I remember the hearing about they had conflict. I don't remember how how it en ended up. Mm. You know, I know that during our founding, both of them were solid. Bible believers, and and this is the, uh, uh, I think the evidence we want to show is that you, we can't see into the heart of man, so I don't know who was born again or not born again, you know, but you don't need to be born again to be a, a faithful steward of our liberty. What you need to be is a believer in the Bible and in the principles of the Bible. You know, so whether Jefferson was born again or John Adams was born again, a, a, a lot of them were U U Unitarians at that point. You know, and, and Unitarians aren't necessarily, they, they don't uh, uh, believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ per se, you know, but they believe in Bible principles. And that's the whole thing. You know, give me a, a pagan who believes in Bible principles, and I'd rather have that person than a quote Christian. Who says he's a Christian but lives like the devil? Yes. Yeah. Uh, all right. So this is the the, the whole thing. It's the Bible principle. Okay. Bill. Yes. Would it be um, uh, Would it be proper to say that they might not have known the author, but they knew the book? 
Absolutely. Uh, yes. They might not have known the author, but they knew the book. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And and m most of them, like I say, were were even committed to the author, even though they may not have believed in all the reports about the author. You know, they believe in his moral principles and in, in, in the book. You're you're right uh, uh, there. But when you look at John Adams and John Quincy Adams, and uh, there was a, a thing uh, done by, uh, I forget now, I don't have it here, maybe in a future time I'll, I'll bring it up, the progeny to, of, of our founders, how many judges and, and statesmen and all came from their line. You know, so many good people came from their line. And that's why it's so important for us because we don't know our children and our grandchildren and what's gonna come from our line. So we want to do the best that we, we can. Do it. No. We, we want to do the best that we that that, 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 we, that we can. All right, moving right along here. So we can keep going. Sam Adams. Now, Sam Adams was cousin to John Adams. All right, known as the father of the American Revolution and the firebrand of the Revolution, Sam Adams was arguably the most effective verbal rabble rouser in American history. It was a leader in the events leading up to the American Revolution, helped to found the Sons of Liberty, formed Boston's Committee of Correspondence, was a member of the First Continental Congress and signed the Declaration of Independence. He helped to draft the Articles of Confederation and served as president in the Massachusetts Senate before becoming the Lieutenant Governor and subsequently the Governor of Massachusetts. He was also a steadfast Christian in, quote, the rights of the colonists, he wrote in 1772, quote, the right to freedom being the gift of the Almighty, the rights of the colonists as Christians may be best understood by reading and carefully studying the institutions of the great lawgiver and head of the Christian church, which are to be found clearly written and promulgated in the New Testament. All right? After signing the Declaration of Independence, he proclaimed, We have this day restored the sovereign to whom all men ought to be obedient. He reigns in heaven, and from the rising to the setting of the sun, let his kingdom come. And in his February 1795 proclamation for a day of public fasting, humiliation, and prayer, then Governor Adams said, quote, that with a true repentance and contrition of heart, we may unitedly implore the forgiveness of our sins through the merits of Jesus Christ, and humbly supplicate to our Heavenly Father to grant us the aids of His grace for the amendment of our hearts and lives, and vouchsafe His smiles upon our temporal concerns. And then finally, these are the words on, in his last will and testament. Now understand, even a simple thing like that, we've heard the phrase, last will and testament. I think we take for granted whatever that means. Mm -hmm. But what it means is last will, this is my la last will, this is what I desire with all my belongings and everything. But my testament is my testimony of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. My testament, this is my testimony, to let you know in case there's any question on your part of where I stand in my faith, this is my testament. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about last will and testament, it's really two parts. This is what I desire, and this is who I am. Uh, people don't realize that. So this was his last will and testament. He said, principally and first of all, I resign my soul to the almighty being who gave it and my body I commit to the dust, relying on the merits of Jesus Christ for the pardon of my sins. So I think that should resolve any questions. You can't get much clearer than that, you know, at that point. Right? All right. And uh, yeah, he was a firebrand, Sam Adams. He was a troublemaker. Mm -hmm. We need more. I don't know, but he made good beer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> today, uh, so fortunate today. Yeah, people who say Madeline's work, they say, "Oh, the guy that makes beer." That's all they know. That's all they know. Yeah, they, they don't know who he really was. All right, Charles Carroll. Charles Carroll was a leader of the American Revolution 
and the only Roman Catholic signer of the Declaration of Independence. He helped to draft the Maryland Constitution, was a member of the Committee of Correspondence, the State Council of Safety, and eventually became a United States Senator, where he helped to establish the Bill of Rights. He attended the Jesuits College at St. Omar, France, and then a seminary in Rheims. As a Catholic, he was opposed to the support of the Anglican Church and wrote his views in a series of articles in the Maryland Gazette. In the letter to John McHenry on, on November 4, 1800, Carroll wrote, quote, without, excuse me, without morals, a republic cannot subsist any length of time. They therefore who are decrying the Christian religion, whose morality is so sublime and pure, and which denounces against the wicked eternal misery, and which ensure to the good eternal happiness are undermining the solid foundations of morals, the best security for the duration of free governments. All right, there again, going back to morals. You can't have moral, you can't have liberty without morals. And then his uh, 89th birthday, 89th, now understand, 89th birthday, you know, today that, that's no big deal. But back then, yes, it is. the average length span was, I think, like 33 years old. Wow. You know? That's so amazing. Back then, I mean, when you graduated <laughs> high school, you were half your lifespan already. Oh, my you're God. You're midlife crisis at 18. You know, <laughs> you're, 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 you know, back then. But we had some people who were exceptions to the rule that lived a lot, lot longer. And his 89th birthday, he wrote, quote, On the mercy of my Redeemer, I rely for the salvation and on his merits, not on the works I have done in obedience to his precepts. So there's uh, another one, uh, Charles Carroll. Now people don't, we, we, you know, we don't appreciate being a Catholic during his time. He was really uh, ostracized by most of the other, uh, even the, the leaders, the founders, because they were very suspicious of Catholics who were under the authority of the Pope. They were giving up their allegiance to their king, but the Catholics weren't giving up their allegiance to their Pope. Mm. So they were concerned that they would start a revolution in the name of the Pope to develop a Catholic country. So for Catholics, it was, very, it was a very difficult time. Uh, the state of Maryland was basically founded by Charles Carroll. You know, and Maryland, you know, the na even the name Mary Land. Oh. came from the whole Catholic thing, you know, that that, that, that that whole thing there. So anyway, so yeah, Charles Carroll was, uh, he had to be a, a brave soul uh, to, 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 to be there. All right. All right. John Hancock. Moving right along. John Hancock, once the wealthiest merchant in Boston, and the problem is that all these guys led, led such interesting lives. You can go on forever on, on e either one of these. John Hancock was groomed by Sam Adams and became one of the leading players in the revolution. He presided over the Second Continental Congress and was the sole signer of the Dunlop Broadside version of the Declaration. He was the first elected governor of Massachusetts and was re-elected eight times. He was re-elected president of the Second Continental Congress after the ratification of the Articles of Confederation and presided over the Massachusetts Convention which ratified the Constitution of the United States. Hancock's signature is the largest on the Declaration of Independence. On April 15, 1775, four days before the, quote, shot heard around the world, he said this, quote, in circumstances dark as these, it becomes us as men and Christians to reflect that whilst every prudent measure should be taken to ward off the impending judgments. All confidence must be withheld from the means we use and reposed only on that God who rules in the armies of heaven and without whose blessing the best human counsels are but foolishness and all created power vanity. What he's saying is, look at us, us few ragged guys you know, uh, uh, here, we're going against the biggest army in the world. We better not rely on our own strength or our own wisdom or our own ideas. Because if God doesn't help us, we're sunk. We're going to be yeah. dead ducks, you know. What is the 
Dunlap broadside version of the declaration. I knew you were going to ask me that. I don't know what it is. Um, <laughs> your homework assignment, look it up. <laughs> well, I learned a good lesson today. So, but the point being that uh, uh, we know the Revolutionary Army, a bunch of ragtag guys, basically the shock heard around the war at, at Lexington Green, those were a bunch, that was one congregation. That was meant from one church, from Pastor Jonas Clark's church, who came out to meet the British. That was his congregation, that, his church that, that came out. And, and there were white men, there were black men, there were, there were all, you know, uh, it was a mixed congregation. Uh, but in the North, we already had segregation. We didn't have what they have in, in, in the South there. So, all right, moving right along. Next page, 13. It is the happiness of his church. That when the powers of earth and hell combine against it, that the throne of grace is of the easiest access, and its appeal thither is graciously invited by the Father of mercies, who has assured it, that when his children ask bread, he will not give them stone. So this is why he's appealing to these guys. Understand, we need to put our trust in God, not in ourselves. Resolve that it be, and thereby recommend it to the good people of this colony, of all denominations that Thursday, the 11th day of May, next be set apart as a day of public humiliation, fasting, and prayer, to confess the sins, to implore the forgiveness of all our transgressions, and a blessing on the husbandry, manufacturers, and other lawful employment of this people, and especially that the union of the American colonies in defense of their rights for hitherto we desire to thank Almighty God may be preserved and confirmed, and that America may soon behold a gracious interposition of heaven by order of the Massachusetts Provincial Congress, John Hancock. All right, that was another government-issued decree that, that uh, we have, that we need to put our trust in God, and another time where they declared a time of prayer and fasting, because if God doesn't help us, we're not going to do it. We can't make it up on, on our own. So it's really important to uh, see where John Hancock stood on, on that whole thing. And the whole idea that uh, uh, they understand, see, our, our people don't realize, we don't appreciate that our government, our rights they professed were not given by government. This is one of the only countries that we declare that our rights are not a product of government, but are given to us by God himself. And that government is not the highest authority. This is the problem with the new left. The new left wants to displace God. Yeah. And they want to be the source of your, your, your uh, supply, of your provisions. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they want to be your God. Yeah. And that therefore, if they're your God, they can determine what your rights are. If we can provide everything you have, it was George Bush Sr. who told us a government that will give you everything you need is, is ready to take away everything you have. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You can also take everything, you know. So that's why we need to fight the idea that government can grant us rights. Government job is not to grant us rights. When we get into the Constitution, we'll talk more about that. But the, the, the job of government in our Constitution is to secure those rights given to us by God. That's the job of government. Not to give rights, but to secure those rights. And again, we're like one of the only countries in, in world history that recognizes that our rights come from God, not from government. All right. All right. Moving right along here. Who do we have next? Let's see, I have my thing. Uh, Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry. Uh, yeah. See. Okay. Boy, I wanted to get through this. Patrick Henry, one, one more guy, and then we can break, break for lunch. Okay, good. We're doing good. Someone. Yeah, we're doing good. Okay. Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry was one of the most successful criminal attorneys of his time. Garnered a reputation as a brilliant orator after his defense of the natural rights of Americans against King George III's interference with the tax laws in Virginia. He served in the First Continental Congress, and in 1775, at the Virginia Convention, he sponsored measures for armed resistance to the British. 
He was a delegate to the Second Continental Congress and then opposed the Constitution because he thought it didn't provide sufficiently for the states and individual rights because he was concerned about the federal government's authority. He championed the adoption of the Bill of Rights. Near the end of his life, he became more and more alarmed at the spread of deism and atheism coming from what he called France's godless revolution. That's what you were talking about, Linda, mm -hmm. the Enlightenment. He served five terms as governor of Virginia after the war. Although he was offered positions in the administration of both Washington and Adams, he declined due to his health. His faith was evident in his so-called, quote, give me liberty or give me death speech. While most of us only remember that one phrase, the speech was peppered with references to God and quotes from both the Old and the New Testament. For instance, he quotes both Jeremiah and Matthew in this paragraph, quote, It is in vain, sir, to extenuate the matter. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war is actually begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? What is that gentleman wish? What would they have? Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Now, I've seen this quote in history books, but it's interesting. The quote that I saw in the history books eliminated two words. And during the end of it, it says, life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of slavery. For, actually, it was four words. Forbid it, almighty God. Those four words were taken out of the history book. Dot, dot, dot. They put dot, dot, dot there. They say, so the idea forbidden, so in the, in the modern history books, it would change in slavery. I know what others may take, but as for me and liberty, give me, give me liberty, give me death. No God. That's what our kids are learning. Yes. Whenever there's any references to God, in this, they put dot, dot, dot. That's so sad. That, that, that's the way they get around saying that they're, they're teaching history, but they're really not. Because separation of church and state, you can't talk about God, so we'll just change history. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, okay? All right. Toward the end of his life, he reportedly read his Bible for hours at a time. He once said to a neighbor, This book is worth all the books that ever were printed, and it has been my misfortune that I never found time to read it with the proper attention and feeling till lately. I trust in the mercy of heaven that it is not too late. See, that should be a warning to all of us mm -hmm. as well. In a letter to his daughter, dated August 20th, 1796, he wrote, Amongst other strange things said of me, I hear it said by the deists that I am one of their number, and indeed that some good people think I am no Christian. This thought gives me much more pain than the appellation of Tory, because I think religion of infinitely higher importance than politics, and I find much cause to reproach myself that I have lived so long and have given no decided and public proofs of my being a Christian. But indeed, my dear child, this is a character which I prize far above all this world has or can boast. You mm -hmm. see? So this is what he's saying to his daughter. That, that, Honey, I'm sorry that people don't know I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. That I fail to be a faithful mm -hmm. witness. That people actually think I'm a deist or something else. That obviously I haven't been forthright enough in my witness to let the world know that I'm a Christian. right? But but I am. And again, what's really good about, about these studies is that we're studying their words. Yeah. Again, not what somebody else said, because somebody else will come and they'll pick out something that 
he said totally out of contact and mm-hmm. say, see, he was no Christian. He was a deist or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. But it's really important to go back to what? To original source documents. Then on his deathbed, Patrick Henry said, Doc, Doctor, I wish you to observe how real and beneficial the religion of Christ is to a man about to die. I am, however, much consoled by reflecting that the religion of Christ has from its first appearance in the world been attracted, been attacked in vain by all the wits, philosophers, and the wise ones, aided by every power of man, and its triumph had been complete. He's on his deathbed, and he's witnessing to the doctor. Wow. You know, trying to, to tell them. On, December, on November 20th, 1798, in his last will and testament, again, last will and testify to who I am, this is all the inheritance I give to my dear family. The religion of Christ will give them one which will make them rich indeed. That's what he's given us. And you know, when I look at that, I say, you know what? I'm not going to have much to pass on to my own posterity mm-hmm. except my faith. Yeah. And that's probably the most important thing mm-hmm. that we can pass on to our posterity it is our faith and take it up from there. So, But it's really important to, to know who these guys were and where, where their faith was at so that we're not duped by, what, by the news that we hear. Uh, there uh, at that point. All right. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. I think we're at a point that we could break. So what time is it? Eleven fifty-four. We're six minutes early. Uh, any any questions at this point about about anything? Questions, comments? Yes, Mark. We're saying they're not so Christian. The, the, this writing excels what we have today. I mean, they sound like pious and fanatical Christian compared <laughs> to today. Yeah. And the speeches they get, you know, even with Trump or Reagan and others, they just said at the end, you know, one word of mentioning of God, right. nothing else. Right. Right. And the good guys and the bad guys. It's yeah. so foreign to us some of this. Yeah, the language. Because it has to be in church you hear something like this, but even in some churches, yeah. it's not this rich. Right. Well I wonder that you know the, the people read they spoke by Belize. Yeah. Their normal conversation, they would be speaking biblical principles just in their normal conversation. You know, they, they didn't like today, if somebody quotes the Bible, we quote chapter and verse, you know, Matthew 16, 33, whatever. Back then, they just spoke it naturally. It was part right. of their conversation. Even yeah. when you say goodbye, it means God be with you. <laughs> so, just the language itself, like you said. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. God yeah. be with you. It was part of the normal life of, of America. It used to be part of our normal life. I mean, you guys are old enough to remember that uh, when the TV stations went off at night, when they would close yep. with a prayer, yeah. Yeah. and they would come on in the morning with a devotion, yep. mm-hmm. a prayer, you, you know? I mean, that was part of the normal life of America. Our high school assemblies always included a Bible reading. Mm-hmm. My first exposure to the Bible was PS 145 in Brooklyn doing every Wednesday we would gather for assembly in the auditorium and the principal would get up and he would open the assembly with a reading from the Old Testament, a reading from the New Testament, then we would sing a hymn. <laughs> that was public school. In the, in the 1950s, yes, I'm in giving away a Take a break and we have lunch break and uh, get lunch into the conference room and then we'll come back at one o'clock for session three.